Hello, everybody. My name is Małgorzata bakalaj dverge and I am Director of Academic Programs at the Center for Jewish History. Together with the Posen Foundation, as well as our partners, American Jewish Historical Society, American Sephardi Federation, Leo Beck Institute, and Evo Institute for Jewish Research, I'm thrilled to welcome you today to our virtual space, to a special, dare I say, the best possible, event to open our fall semester of academic programs at the Center. The Center for Jewish History is a home for the archival collections of five partner institutions, American Jewish Historical Society, American Sephardi Federation, Leo Beck Institute, Evo Institute for Jewish Research, and Yeshiva University Museum. Together, these collections create the second largest archive of the Jewish experience in the world. Now, more than ever, the center is primarily an intellectual home for exchanges of ideas, scholarship, creative practice, and groundbreaking encounters that are inspired and informed by these archival collections. These encounters, such as the one today, further inform and inspire our understanding of the times we live in. Today, we celebrate a fascinating project that brings together an extraordinary collection of primary sources in a series called the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. And I have it here next to me. Volume six of this series, edited by Elisheva Karlebach, promises to, and indeed does, confront modernity in the broadest transnational and transdisciplinary strokes yet with nuanced precision and illuminating depth. Elisheva Karlebach will be joined by author Dara Horn in the conversation led by Deborah Dashmore, the series editor-in-chief. Itaman Borohov will expand our experience with his short concert of songs in dialogue with the themes of our program. Our schedule is packed today, uh, so this is only a brief welcome but I cannot miss this opportunity to express our great gratitude to the Posen Foundation, the Posen Library, Bridget Marmion and Johanna Ramos-Boyer for a truly inspiring collaboration and hope that our program today starts a new semester of discussions that will continue in both virtual and physical spaces. Before I leave the stage to all our discussants, I would like to inform you of two important maintenance items. First of all, you are welcome to write down your questions for the Q&A portion of our program. To do so, please use the Q&A function, which is visible on the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions throughout the program. Uh, secondly, our program is recorded and will be available via the center's website and YouTube channel soon, and we will be emailing you with the link to the recording as well. Now, let's begin with a short introduction by Daniel Posen, the co-founder and CEO of the Posen Foundation, and then join a fascinating conversation led by Deborah Dashmore. Enjoy your evening. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Posen, and I'm honored to introduce volume six, Confronting Modernity, 1750 to 1880 of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. Eli Shever Karlebach, the editor of this very fine volume, has produced a work my father, Felix Posen, and I are proud to add to the series. Felix is unable to be with us tonight, but he sends his very best wishes as the Posen Library was his brainchild after all. In the early 2000s, Felix gathered leading scholars in the United States and Israel to think about ways to share the richness of Jewish culture and ideas with the world. Born out of the frustrations with the narrowness of Jewish education, my father's aim was to ensure that all people who read English and especially all Jews could easily access a variety of Jewish sources, secular as well as sacred, literature as well as philosophy, paintings as well as ritual objects. North African and Argentinian, as well as Eastern European. This esteemed group came up with the idea and became the advisory board of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, a 10 volume printed compilation of primary sources, global Jewish writing and art from the biblical period 
to the 21st Century and published by Yale University Press. Even the smart scholars in the room with my father back in the early 21st century could not have predicted coming changes. Responding to digital education, we developed an online interactive version of the Posen Library. The Posen Digital Library, the, D, uh, the PDL as it's known, uh, is uh, available at the Posen Library uh, .com website, provides unprecedented access to these diverse sources. We are proud to offer the digital library free upon registration to every reader, and we hope students, educators, researchers will find it especially useful. The question for this webinar this afternoon is, whose story will become Jewish history? The Posen Foundation has been addressing this question in various forms for well over a decade. In Israel, the Posen Foundation works with educators to consider their own identity and the multitude of backgrounds of their students when developing these curricula. Posen Foundation programs have now reached more than 80,000 pupils in well over 200 schools. By this time next year, half the library will be complete and the other half is not far behind. This project's magnitude extends beyond anything my father could have imagined. Once finished, the library will make available more than 7,000 pieces of Jewish culture from around the world. This could not have happened with, without the dedication of our editor-in-chief, Deborah Dashmore, a Jewish historian. She will lead our discussion today. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you for that. And now I'm going to invite to the stage uh, Deborah Dashmore, who is going to be leading our conversation, just as uh, Daniel told us. And again, I will say goodbye for tonight. Uh, Deborah, the stage is yours. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Malgo. Um, we're here to talk this afternoon about the amazing history and culture in confronting modernity, 1750 to 1880, volume six of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. As you heard, our focus will be on midwives, musicians, soldiers, rabbis, whose stories shall we tell? Whose stories will make up Jewish history? And the title and ref question reflect the explicit challenge of this volume. Before I introduce our wonderful participants, let me just say a few words about the 10 volume Posen Library. It would have been a relatively easy task to edit a volume if this were going to be just another collection of the greatest hits of the Jewish past. But to create an anthology that brought sacred and secular together that understood Jewish to refer to women as well as men, that included expressions of Jewish civilization from around the globe, since Jews were and are a global diasporic people, that made accessible knowledge previously restricted to people who could read many languages. To assemble such an anthology was unprecedented. And it took not quite a village, not quite a small army, as my mother used to say, but a spirit of willing collaboration and sharing of expertise from scholars, translators, permission experts, researchers, and editors. Elie Sheva Kalbach tackled this daunting task. A professor of Jewish history at Columbia University, she possesses a substantial and distinguished publication record. Among her many books, um, uh, several stand out for their penetrating and unusual approach. For example, Palaces in Time, Jewish Calendar and Culture in Early Modern Europe, uses handwritten calendars prepared by Jews to uncover their quotidian ex experiences, how sacred and mundane intersected. In her book, In Divided Souls, um, Converts from Judaism in Germany, Elisheva argued brilliantly and persuasively for including these men and women within the compass of Jewish history. 
One of the side benefits of this massive anthology project is the discovery of new primary sources for understanding Jewish history. And Elisheva translated one of the selections in the volume, the opening words of Rosa, the midwife's register of births in the Dutch city of Groningen. Rosa writes a fervent request to the Lord, and I quote, that the Lord not let my hands falter while I am engaged in this profession. Dara Horn joins Elisheva for this conversation. Dara has written many amazing novels, but I want to mention just two that draw upon the Jewish experience. All Other Nights, which is set um, in the American Civil War at the time of Passover, and A Guide for the Perplexed, which is set in Egypt, and the discovery of medieval records preserved in the Geniza. Both delve deep into Jewish worlds that come alive through Dara's powerful imagination. Since we're here to discuss the Posen Library, however, I should note that two selections from Dara Horn's writing um, are included in volume 10 of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. One, on filling shoes, she wrote as a 15-year-old after going on the March of the Living um, to Auschwitz. The other is a selection from her award-winning novel, In the Image. You can find both of them, along with most of the other selections from volume six and 10 on the Posen Digital Library, which is available free upon registration. Our third participant this afternoon is Itamar Barakhov, and we're going to have the opportunity to hear a short performance by him of Quando El Rey Nimrod and Rojinka Mitmandlin. Itamar is a bit too young to be included in the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. He is a musician, which means that he works in a genre that is very difficult to capture within the pages of a book or even in a digital library. This is one of the reasons why we're thrilled that he is contributing to this session, helping to make the oral dimensions of the Posen Library come alive. He has numerous, numerous accomplishments despite his youth. Um, Borchov describes himself as creating a new musical hybrid, bringing the sounds of his upbringing in Jaffa and the Sephardic sacred music he heard there to a classic jazz quartet setting in New York City. His latest release is Blue Nights. Let me just emphasize that he chose several selections inspired by the Posen Library to play for us. And now, without further ado, let's start our conversation. When we think about the Jewish past, what should we think about? Who should we consider? The Jewish past has always been thought about in terms of rabbis and philosophers, the writings of great intellectuals and religious figures. Eli Sheva, what are some of the stories of midwives, musicians, soldiers, rabbis that we might tell? We just are seeing now a slide of one selection in the Posen Library, the register of a Jewish midwife. Why is Rose's story important? Thanks so much for starting off with this wonderful source, Deborah. Um, I look upon each of the sources or selections that we have in the volume as ports of entry. Each is marvelous unto itself, but it also opens up into something much larger. So Rosa was a midwife. She hand wrote this book. This is her title page. She wrote a fabulous introduction. Um, I want our audience to note uh, that the two columns on this page are two different language versions. On the right side, the Hebrew that begins with the word zeh. On the left side, the Yiddish that begins with the word Jesus. She also wrote in Dutch. So here we have this amazing source, an entire world, medicine, childbirth, record keeping. Who knew that there were hundreds of babies born in the city of Groningen? in the Netherlands in the 18th century. I didn't even dream about it. Um, here are these highly literate 
Jewish professionals in the early modern period that we know nothing about. Virtually every aspect of this can be explored further and that's the beauty of these sources. You explore the contexts and whole worlds un unfold. And next to that, we have this beautiful painting by the Polish Jewish painter, Maurizi Gottlieb. What a passionate young man and artist. First of all, there's his own story. He was born into a Polish Jewish family of 11 children, was admitted to the Academy of Arts when he was 15 years old and threw himself into a frenzy that led to his death when his beloved rejected him. Uh, he died at age 23 uh, and left a, an indelible legacy. But besides his own story, there's the stories that he tells in his paintings. And it's a beautiful painting. And my eye was always drawn, not just to the self-portrait of Gottlieb standing right in the center with his hand on his brow, uh, not just to the beautiful Torah mantle, but with, which is embroidered by Jewish women. And if you blow it up uh, on some other site, you can see that the letters say donated by the Gottlieb family, but also <laughs> uh, to the women's gallery, which he includes. And it's full of little groupings and all kinds of family dramas. Um, who knows what stories he's telling there? And my eye was particularly drawn to the woman standing on the left. Uh, it's a little difficult to see what she's holding up there. Is she the prayer leader, the fear Zuggerin, who used to play a role in Jewish synagogues way before modern times? So many stories here. The past is filled with stories that we know, and they are represented in this volume but we also wanted to highlight some of the untold stories. And that's what we hope you'll see, both the familiar and the new. So one of the ways in which new material comes uh, out in the, these volumes um, is through opening up the possibility of contributing to the Jewish past to everyone. Um, Jews who lived not just in Europe or the United States, um, but also in the Ottoman Empire, North Africa, Latin America. The volume includes uh, Sephardic culture from around the world and Ladino culture, which is reaching its apogee at this point in the um, Ottoman world. Dara, when we look at people who live these diverse experiences, how does this uh, change the content of Jewish civilization? Well, first, I just want to say this book is fantastic. Um, anyone who's listening this evening needs to check it out, whether digitally or in print. Uh, hats off to Ellie Shev and everyone who made it happen. And also thanks to everyone at Center for Jewish History for putting together uh, today's fantastic event. So I'm thrilled to be here. I will say as a, as a historical novelist that one thing I've noticed writing historical fiction is that historical fiction, and I think this is also true um, for historical scholarship, is always, it's always about the time in which it's being written, not the time in which it supposedly takes place, right? Because there has to be a reason why we're drawn to think back on a particular period, whether in my case in an imagination-driven way or in a scholarship-driven way. And I think that we are looking for what uh, historians, Jewish historians have, have called the usable past. Jewish community today is much more um, international, much more interconnected than it has been in the past. We have a much more broad idea of what constitutes you know, uh, authentic Jewish experience. And I think we're looking for the past to, um, to show that. I wanted to point to just two uh, visual pieces from this period that really illustrate that in kind of a meta way and in a more immediate way. So for the more meta way, this uh, image that's on your screen now, um, this painting by uh, Morris Daniel Oppenheim, Lavater and Lessing visit Moses Mendelssohn. So Moses Mendelssohn, of course, is sort of this very, you know, uh, famous historical Jewish figure. He's sort of the father of the um, idea of the Jewish enlightenment that, you know, you can be a person out in the world and, but still, you know, remain Jewish. 
you see him in this painting interacting with these two um, you know, non-Jewish intellectuals of his time. What I th- and what I think is amazing about this painting, though, is that this is painted 50 years after he's dead. So this is already an artist who is looking back into the Jewish past for that usable element, right? So you have this idea of this, you know, someone, uh, the artist Morris Oppenheim, who wants to look back and say, look, it is possible, it even was possible 50 years ago to be a Jew in the world and still to be participating in tradition. I think, again, to uh, follow Elie Sheva's lead and pointing out those elements of the picture we don't always notice, I want to point out the woman uh, coming through uh, with the food in the back. You know, which perhaps suggests that we're eating at home, perhaps that uh, Mendelssohn is still keeping the dietary laws, the laws of kashrut, even though uh, entertaining these uh, non-Jewish intellectuals. So that's sort of an example of the high art that you find in this, that this, that this book is sort of opening up to us. For a more popular element, I wanted to uh, share with you another piece that I thought was fascinating. This is an amulet. This is actually from in- the Jewish community in India. So, you know, a community we don't, you know, have a lot of, you know, canonical scholarship about usually. But what's amazing to me about this piece, this is sort of a a lot of mystical prayers and incantations for the health of the mother and the health of the newborn. What I think is amazing, though, first of all, just, you know, beautiful, beautifully made. But what I think is fascinating is you look at it carefully. What you see on it, and I think you can see this on your screen, is the folds, this was a piece of art that was used. This was folded, it was put in some woman's pocket or slipped into a newborn swaddle or into, you know, or, or into someone's clothing to keep with them, um, to keep this tradition with them in this moment, you know, in, in, in this transitional moment in their life. And as a 21st century mother, a Jewish mother of four myself, I know that, you know, I'm not the, perhaps the most uh, traditional person, but I carried uh, amulet not unlike this with me when I was uh, in the delivery room four times with my children. So what I think is amazing about this book is how it brings together those sort of that high art and also that popular art, but really it captures that intimacy, which is I think what we're looking for now and when we look back at the Jewish past. So thank you. I mean, since you've mentioned historians, um, historians are always interested in periodization. Elie Sheva, you gave the um, book the, the title, Confronting Modernity, and in your introduction, you write that this historical moment, and I'm going to quote you, is, was one in which every aspect of Jewish life underwent the most profound changes to have occurred since antiquity, close quote. And yet, at the same time, you also note that there were extraordinary innovations designed to preserve to adapt and to revitalize um, traditions. So what is modernity and what does it mean for Jews to confront modernity? Well, that's a big question. Thank you, Deborah. First, what modernity does not mean. It does not mean the wholesale abandonment or erasure of the Jewish tradition of the past. What it means is choice for Jews as legal barriers that discriminated against them and treated them as pariahs under the law began to fall. And even more slowly, social barriers begin to fall. Cafes, opera, uh, streets, art school, uh, Jews who wished and had the talent could enter these institutions and compete on the merits. They were not treated anymore as a collective. Their identity was not imposed upon them by a hostile uh, entity of some government. And that instilled in Jews of this period a tremendous sense of optimism, of new horizons opening up, a sense of history moving forward and recognizing people as human beings, as the artists, the writers, Uh, and simply the people they were. Now, this is not to say that there were no exceptions in this period. Yes, there was anti-Semitism, you know, but but my my own sense of reading through so much material, the the newspapers, the journals, the the artwork that pours out, the the private uh, memories, is that underlying this period is a sense that history is moving forward to a better place. So who do we include 
in this? Um, how do you, how do you um, make the uh, decision of, of what to include as part of Jewish uh, culture and civilization? So that was a really difficult question that I confronted uh, when making choices for this volume. And ultimately, my criteria were things that emerged out of a Jewish matrix, even if they don't necessarily appear to be Jewish on the surface, were included. The seductive element of modernity is this making of choices and allowing Jews to shape their own Jewish identity voluntarily. So I include representatives of every voice and choice that I thought reflected in some way on Jewish life in this period, from every corner of the globe, in over a dozen languages, men, women, children, rich and poor, and everybody in the middle. Think about certain things. Jews enter the military in this period for the first time since the biblical period. What did that feel like to those who are participating in this monumental shift? Sephardic women, such as Emma Lazarus and Grace Aguilar, are the first among the first major Jewish writers in English. Jews are pioneering in the sciences and the legal professions and all kinds of arts and photography and other fields. How do we capture that between the covers of one volume. That was the challenge. Okay, so um, among the things that that you mentioned, right, um, behind them is mobility itself, right? The fact that Jews are on the move in in this period. They're moving into cities, uh, there's this rise of cafe culture, Jewish women are opening their homes to conduct salons. We get periodicals in, in tons of different languages. Dara, when you think about mobility, um, what's the impact of mobility on Jews um, in in this era? Well, when I was researching my novel about uh, Jews during the Civil War, um, and I will say a lot of the sources uh, from that are included in this volume, which are fantastic. What, one of the things I discovered was this strange uh, difference between the Jewish population in the United States at that time and the non-Jewish population, which is that, as you say, the Jewish population was much more mobile. You had, you know, most Jews who, came, who were living in the United States at that time were, they weren't farmers for the most part. A lot of them were traveling salesmen, peddlers, and the, the difficulty of that kind of uh, job is beautifully captured in this book with these reminiscences of these peddlers carrying these packs on their shoulders throughout uh, the United States. But what that meant was that you had sort of, you had a community, when you're, if, when you're a traveling salesman or a merchant, you don't do that by yourself. You're not like a homesteader. It's like you need a network, right? You need a distributor. You need a supplier. You need sort of a way of getting goods and services one place to another. And so you had these uh, Jewish families that set up businesses where they would have one family member in one city and one in another city, similar to what had, had been happening in Europe at this time as well and in other parts of the world. And what that meant, though, is that when the country split at the time of the Civil War, you have a lot of Jews on both sides of the war who actually have a a, a kind of empathy for people on the other side, which their neighbors didn't necessarily share. And that's because unlike their neighbors, they actually knew people on the other side. Um, And so you have this bizarre sort of situation where, you know, Ellie Shevin mentioned this is the first time, you know, since ancient times that you have Jews, you know, in armed forces. This is also the first time uh, that you have Jews in the armed forces fighting other Jews, um, you know, in two opposing armies. And that's true here and also, you know, in Franco-Prussian War and other, uh, you know, conflicts in this period. And uh, the, and sort of the, the drama of the Civil War is really captured in this book. There's a a, a terrific uh, description of a Passover Seder among Union soldiers in uh, rural West Virginia where, you know, they get matzah from, I don't remember, Cincinnati or something, but then they don't have haroset, they use a brick, you know, an actual brick on the Seder plate. They have a, you know, a, a giant barrel of hard cider instead of wine. They have a little more than four glasses of that and start reenacting the, the biblical stories. It's very funny. But what is interesting about those stories to me, too, is that they're written in English. 
And I think you sort of see this leap then in this period too, where you have, as you mentioned, Deborah, there, you know, this transition from Jewish to non-Jewish languages and back and forth. Um, and I think that something also changes and that's part of that mobility too, is right, these are people who are able to move between Jewish and non-Jewish cultures, writing in non-Jewish languages, thinking and, and living their lives in non-Jewish languages, but also simultaneously in many cases, maintaining Jewish languages. And I think that that sort of is that beginning of that con confrontation with modernity too, is that fluidity, which is captured in language. Mm -hmm. We're going to share with you, uh, are, are we ready to, to share the musical element? Okay, okay great. So we're going to share with you uh, today um, this uh, performance by Itamar Borchov and uh, Gadi Lahavi, who are going to perform for you two pieces that I think kind of capture a lot of this. These are um, two musical pieces, from one from the Sephardi world and one from the Ashkenazi world from this period. And these are both songs that were popular songs at the time and 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 but what's interesting to me about them you're going to be hearing an instrumental version but if you look at the lyrics which you can find in the book there these are songs that are about intimate experiences so the safari song um uh quando el rey nimrod is about the birth of abraham but part of it is from the point of view of abraham's mother which is, you know, not a character who appears in the Torah, you know, is perhaps mentioned in some rabbinic sources, but there's this kind of intimacy that this is like this birth experience, going back to that, um, you know, the midwife theme and these, you know, this, you know, including women in this story. And that's true also with the Ashkenazi piece uh, that they're going to perform, Rojin Kesmet Manlen. This is a song that's from the Yiddish theater from this time, but it's also, it's a lullaby. And so it has that kind of domestic intimacy, which, you know, people didn't used to associate with, you know, high art and which, you know, we're now broadening this idea of Jewish culture to include, um, uh, you know, these fantastic pieces. And you get to hear them today um, in a 21st century interpretation of them. So I, I invite you to listen and enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Itamar and Gadi. That was just wonderful. And what a great reminder that there are some experiences and some forms of culture that you just can't capture in words on a page. All the words in the world can't produce the same effect as hearing the notes or the voices seeing the canvas and the paint on it in front of you, watching a live performance, attending a Hasidic tish, sitting in the Beit Midrash, studying. Uh, so many experiences. Um, so poor are the tools we have to capture them. And I think Itamar's work also underscores another motif that we've been highlighting in our discussion, um, which is that Jews do not abandon traditional forms of culture as time moves on. Instead, uh, we take those materials, we transform them, or sometimes they coexist quite comfortably beside the new. So what you're seeing between two hard covers, uh, or maybe on a flat screen, uh, again, is a foretaste of worlds of experience that one can really plumb uh, almost infinitely. And that's something of what this volume intends to open up uh, for, for all our readers. Well, and I wanna point out also um, that that beautiful performance the second song that they played, Rojan Kesmit Manlan, actually is part of, is actually sort of a key, like, a uh, turning point in the way we understand Jewish culture. And so I'm really glad everybody was able to hear it. This, this song is actually from, it's, you know, we think of it as a folk song, and, you know, it's often called that, but it actually was written by um, a man named Avram Goldfaden, who is the founder of the Yiddish theater. And, you know, today we think of theater, at least in the English-speaking world, we've perhaps for a long time thought of theater as this high art form. But in, Yiddish theater starts during this period. Um, Avram Goldfaden was performing his works in a wine garden, right? I mean, he's basically, you know, putting on these shows in a beer hall. Um, and, you know, it was, it was exactly that kind of atmosphere. Um, and again, to, you know, as Ellie Sheva said, there's this whole world you can't capture. Um, part of it is, you know, the atmosphere of what it was like to hear these works or, or experience them as they were performed. It's almost like when you look back at Shakespeare and, you know, we read it as high art now, but at the time, you know, people were throwing vegetables at the stage. And I think when you look at Gold, what Goldfaden accomplished, it really captures what this um, experience that Eli Chavez really put together in this book of confronting modernity, because the origins of Yiddish theater start in a sort of a religious format, right? Because the beginnings of Jewish performance are in something like the Purim Spiels, or in the work of the Badchen, which was these wedding jesters, some of whose work are captured in this book. I mean, that is something that's almost never available to, you know, in, to, for English speakers to see these sort of amazing wordplay and this sort of thing that was part of the humor and that it was like stand-up comics basically that performed at weddings and he took those sort of elements and brought them into this theater and in the process he kind of broadened the boundaries of what culture was and what Jewish culture was and I think you see this in lots of ways in this book you see in this period the um, creation of a uh, salon culture right where you have sort of these um, you know informal conversations which really become the foundation of really important ideas and so this whole moment is really this, you know, amazing moment of transition. And I think it's very relatable for, for us today in the 21st century where, you know, we're living through all kinds of cultural transitions in the Jewish world and beyond it. So 
I want to bring in now some of the visual since we've heard the oral because it was wonderful to hear these two very different kinds of sounds but uh, right next to each other, right? Um, brought together, which is something that we're doing. Um, they would not necessarily have been performed in, in that way uh, back in the 19th century. And the volume includes these incredibly beautiful um, examples of Jewish visual and material culture. I particularly love its diversity. I mean, you have a, a sukkah from Trieste, you have depictions of preparing the body for burial that we saw a little bit before from Prague. You have this Torah arc a curtain from Turkey. You've got Delacroix's uh, portrait of Saada, who is um, from Tangier. Um, and all of this in the space, if you're actually reading the, the physical volume, in the, the space of 15 pages, right, covering 1775 to 1832. Now, one of the most amazing ones is um, a Haggadah, a remarkable illustration of a Haggadah. And um, you, there you see it on your, on your screen. Ellie Shepard, can you comment a bit uh, about this beautiful, beautiful illustration? Yeah. When, when I started looking for material for this volume, this particular object immediately caught my eye as something very special, and I knew I wanted to feature it in some way in the volume. So it is a handwritten and hand-illustrated Haggadah for Passover, crafted by Charlotte von Rothschild. She was one of the most prominent and wealthy patrons of art and culture in her day. And uh, as far as we know, this is the first manuscript Haggadah to be written by a woman and illustrated by a woman. Her family had fabulous collections of European art, palatial homes, uh, jewels. She could have chosen any object in any field. And she chose to put her energies as a special gift to someone in her family and do a Haggadah, which exemplifies the pride she took in her Jewishness. She wanted to project that outward. There's so much to admire and learn from the Haggadah, but the image that caught my heart and that I chose for the cover of the volume, because it captured for me the vitality, the sense of freedom, joy, and forward motion of Jews leaving the chains of enslavement to another culture and another society and setting their own spiritual agenda and cultural path forward. This just distilled it for me um, in some way uh, and I chose it for the cover. Miriam, right? Miriam leading the women in, in yes. song. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. It is beautiful. Um, Ellie Sheva, I'm really curious about the process of, of creating this. Um, you know, when I was flipping through this book um, and just, you know, really just, unfortunately, it's not the kind of book you could just flip through because you start reading and then you want to read more and then, you know, you woke up at the clock and it's like four hours later. You know, it reminded me in some ways of the way um, of the Cairo Geniza, right, which was this enormous um, archive of medieval sources that was sort of discovered in uh, the 19th century by uh, uh, Solomon Schechter. And he sort of, you know, picked it all up, brought it to Cambridge University in England. And he then went through it and found, you know, what he thought was important, right? He found like, you know, here's a letter from, you know, these rabbinic sources, you know, here's these, you know, these, you know, great men writing great Torah scholarship. And he's like, this is what matters. And the rest of it, a lot of it was put in boxes that literally were labeled rubbish in the, um, in, um, in the uh, Cambridge University Library. And it wasn't until 50 years later that S.D. Goitain, an another Jewish scholar, came and looked through the that rubbish and was like, actually, there's a lot of fantastic material here. And sort of you know, re you know, sort of found all these, you know, documents, again, by women and by, you know, not famous people and by people who weren't Torah scholars, but that just illuminated this world. 
you know, I, I imagine you sort of being that person going through the Geniza um, and, and, you know, through enormous amounts of material and trying to, you know, and you're in that position of you get to decide, as we say, who, what becomes Jewish history. And I'm, I'm really curious about how, how you made those decisions. Well, first I have to say I envy somebody who went through the Geniza and looked up four months later. It took me at least a dozen years later to look up from the vast amount of material that I had to choose from here. And um, I do want to say that the criteria for selection were what interested me as a human being, what intrigued, what caught my eye, um, and what I thought would please and delight readers, uh, both those who have deep Jewish backgrounds and those who are not Jewish at all or uh, really come to this with very little background. Um, so we adopted an extremely inclusive uh, view of what, what goes in here. So yes, we have rabbis and we have philosophers, um, but we also have renegades. Uh, this is a period, for example, in which you have the birth of Hasidism, a new movement in which people are finding new ways to express their joy at being the people chosen by God. They're living with God every day in their daily lives. How are they doing that? It's not a traditional movement. It's a new movement. And in the same world, at the same time, we have people who chose to leave Judaism, who chose to forge a path outside of the Jewish fold completely to embrace the larger culture by converting to Christianity. Uh, famous names like Marx and Heinrich Heine and Benjamin Disraeli and others. Um, and this came out of a sense of Jewish despair or maybe a complexity of their backgrounds. They didn't want to be burdened by it anymore, but it occurred in such great numbers that to obscure that movement would have done an injustice to history. So kind of bottom line, I want to conclude by saying that what I try to provide the readers of the volume and the visitors to the website was a set of keys. You can take it and you can say, hey, look at this great key collection. Some of them are gold and they're encrusted in jewels and other, others are rusty and ancient. What a great collection of old keys. Or you can say, each one of these keys unlocks a treasure house of unfathomable riches, adventures for the serious, delights for the curious. I took a voyage across an ocean of material. I chose the things that I think will speak to readers today as a human being and as a historian of the Jewish people. And now, dear audience, it is your turn to dive into that ocean. An incredible adventure awaits you. Well, thank you so much. I think that we're up for some questions. And we, we've got um, a couple of them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few. And um, we'll, start, we'll start with this one which is a, a sort of, what can we say, a Passover uh, kind of question. In what ways is the Posen Library's Volume 6 different from other general histories of the period? So this is not a history of the period. The first mandate of this volume was to allow the readers to hear the voices directly. It is a collection of primary sources they are textual, they are visual, they're also oral, at least by reference, um, A-U-R-A-L, we, we refer to music, we refer to, to, to many different genres. And in terms of its scope, I don't know of another work uh, that embraces a dialect Arabic spoken in a certain port Yemenite Jews and uh, some of their culture 
along with England and France and Latin America and Hungary and Poland and Russia. Um, it, it is truly global in its embrace uh, that Jews lived everywhere in the world, practically, expressed their Jewishness in a multiplicity of ways. And these are delightful and teach us something uh, in terms of making choices in our own lives. Okay. All right. So um, we have several um, questions which uh, ask sort of about um, what, when did the barriers um, against Jews begin to fall and whether the, the entry of Jews into a wider world um, stemmed from uh, secularism in European culture or from the Enlightenment. So really sort of the, a question, I guess, uh, about causation, right? Um, and, and the time period of the, of the changes. Yeah. So the changes that are taking place are in the larger world in a certain way, and Jews are responding to them. Uh, if you really want to go all the way back, you can go back to... Uh, the Lutheran Reformation, which broke the hegemony of the Catholic Church and its uh, sense of the place of Jews in its world, uh, which was the law all over, all over Europe where the Catholic Church held uh, almost unbroken power until the Reformation. This doesn't mean things broke down then, but it began to kind of allow people to imagine a world in which religion and the state did not necessarily have to have the same goals. Both Spinoza and Mendelssohn and so many other Enlightenment thinkers who were not Jews argued that religion was a question of conscience and the state didn't need to maintain in its laws discrimination against those, whether they were Protestants in a Catholic country, Catholics in a Protestant country, Jews in both. So that, that I think is the beginning of barriers breaking down. There are hundreds of different rivulets that flow into this giant movement. It's a question of legal thinkers, it's a question of new, new ways of thinking about history and the past uh, in the non-Jewish world, uh, which allowed people to see the Jews for the people they were, both the good and the bad, as opposed to collectively uh, judging them as guilty uh, before any, uh, guilty of, of the sin that they did, the original sin uh, against Christianity. So once that, that slowly gets to be removed uh, and some of the negative social beliefs that Jews were uh, backward, coarse, uneducated, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, once some of those stereotypes are blown away, uh, it allows a new discourse to emerge. And this is happening again through what I would call the early modern period leading up to this volume. Uh, and then you've got, again, in France, the French Revolution, uh, which is in one stroke, the liberation of an entire people uh, from a caste system, if one wishes. Uh, so that there is a lot of change and that, that takes decades, if not centuries of deep thinking uh, to imagine what a world could look like uh, without the prejudices of old governing it. And what I think is interesting in this book too is that it isn't, it's how the Jews responded to these things that were affecting um, other communities, but it isn't, it's, it's also some ways in which they responded differently than their neighbors. Um, and I think you see that in the sort of the diversity um, that Ellie Sheva mentioned before in terms of the Hasidic movement being a new movement, right? Like today we think of this as like, oh, this is traditional. This was a radical religious movement that emerges at this time. And I think that there's also the sort of subtle differences that come from this being a small community that in some cases sort of is responding to um, modernity differently. We were talking earlier about the American Civil War and one of the things that 
I was talking about the sort of mobility that Jews knew each other on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. A weird phenomenon there institutionally is that Elisheva was just talking about sort of, you know, this is the idea of religion being, you know, conscience versus identity. Um, the Jews did not always see it that way. And what I think is a, a telling detail in this moment in the Civil War was that um, in around 1860, when you have the beginnings of the, of, of the Southern states, you know, starting to leave the Union or talking about leaving the Union, a lot of churches in the United States, national organizations of the churches split. At that point. That's why today, even to this day, you have Southern Baptists, Southern Methodists. These were divided institutions. And there were national Jewish organizations at, in the United States at the time of the Civil War, and none of them split at the time of the Civil War. There wasn't a Northern B'nai B'rith and a Southern B'nai B'rith, right? They, it was stayed the same. And so, you know, both of these things are fascinating, right? The ways in which the Jews are responding to modernity like everyone else, but also the ways in which they aren't. And I think that a lot of that diversity of responses is really captured in this book. So one of the things that's um, really interesting are, are the opportunities that you get um, when you go to the digital version, right? So if you, if you log in um, to the Posen, uh, library com, right, and register, you see all of these uh, individual um, selections in, um, in a different way, and you can, you can access them. When you, when you look at them together in the book, they are um, sort of in conversation with each other um, that way. And um, so a number of people are, are interested in um, uh, questions about class and um, women in, in the shtetl, uh, women who are um, not uh, upper class. Um, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing here about these, um, uh, these questions and uh, what kind of um, power um, such women had who were, who were less privileged. So just, um, just to answer that question from some of the sources we collected, uh, one of the lives and voices of women who were in many ways uh, so marginalized, they're marginalized as Jews, and then within the Jewish community, they're marginalized as women. Um, we attended to that a lot. Uh, there are many women's voices here. And there's no question that through the ages, class had a great deal to do with where women were able to wield power. Uh, women who had the chance uh, to learn how to read and write uh, were able to express themselves, were able to conduct businesses, were able to uh, be productive in certain ways. Um, that we could, would not have imagined. Um, I remember many years ago, uh, I was commenting on a play based on the life of Glickel Hamelin. Um, and she was a very active entrepreneurial businesswoman her entire life, as was her mother. And one of the people in the audience said, but that's impossible. Women didn't really begin working out of the home until the 1970s. Uh, and and that brought home for me uh, something about the misconceptions we have about the past. Mm -hmm. uh, women were very active in all kinds of commerce, in uh, all kinds of cultural production, in communal activities. No, they could not be rabbis. No, there were certain barriers that they had. Uh, but beyond that, uh, they had their own forms of agency, their own forms of social uh, gatherings, uh, of networking, and they were extremely strong about this. There would be no Jewish community without the women who hold it together. And I refer back to that image we had of the burial society. Um, men did not prepare women for death. So in any Jewish community, there was a women's burial society side by side with the male burial society. And they wield a lot of power. Midwives wielded a lot of power. They had to answer questions about, um, you know, which twin was born first? Who was the father of this mm -hmm. pregnant maidservant? Yeah. Uh, you know, how, how do you, 
they and and they're appointed by the communities. These are professionals who are out there doing their work, and we don't really know about them. But that's not their fault. That's the fault of historians who privileged certain intellectual activities, as though Jewish history is all about the mind and doesn't have any uh, other social or corporeal existence, which we now know, of course, is not the way to do history. That comment that um, your reader made about, oh, women only worked outside the home in the 1970s is like particularly hilarious for those of us who study the Ashkenazi Jewish world, because in you know Ashkenazi Eastern Europe, it was like, the women were the ones who worked outside of the home so that the men could study Torah, right? I mean, that was the sort of the hierarchy. It's like, you know, if you were wealthy enough to have only one person working, it was the woman so the man could devote himself to Torah and Talmud study. So in a sense, that hierarchy in the Jewish world of Torah study being the highest occupation sort of allowed, it was part of what, you know, enabled women or not, you know, or, or in some ways, you know, forced women to be out in the world. Often women were ones who knew the local non-Jewish languages better than men because they were the ones running these businesses. And one thing I would say about uh, the, in terms of the development of Yiddish literature, the first audience for Yiddish literature were women readers because these were people who learned Yiddish, they were reading Yiddish, they were not, not often were not taught Hebrew or, or, you know, the sort of the holy languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. And sort of, you know, the beginnings of Yiddish literature, part of the reason why, um, you know, the high culture sort of looked down on Yiddish literature was because it was considered you know, this was women's culture, like, oh, why are you writing books for women? Because that was the audience for this. But of course, this sort of then became something much broader. And I think that's what you see in this volume is the beginning of that sort of broadening of the idea of what culture really is. So we haven't had as much time to talk about soldiers. And there was a question about that. We did show the Pinkas, a, a, um, a minute book that was, uh, is part of the, um, uh, volume six of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, but we didn't re sort of reflect upon what that, um, that minute book sort of represents in terms of Jews entering the military. We did talk about soldiers on both sides of the Civil War um, and fighting each other, but I, I thought maybe just to let people recognize what they had seen would be useful. So Elishava, did you want to just say a, a couple words about soldiers? We're going to have to wrap up very soon. Yeah, so just so. very briefly, my colleague at Columbia, Michael Stanislavski, wrote a beautiful book That's called right. Psalms for the Tsar, and it puts this particular object at its center. You have these uh, people who have been drafted into the Tsarist army who come together as Jews and form a chevra tehillim, a circle, a society of people who are saying psalms and they, they are praising the czar. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful piece of, of culture. And it's not the only one. It doesn't really tell us about their experience in the field. Um, but as Dara mentioned, we have soldiers, Jewish soldiers who fought in uh, the Civil War. Uh, we saw a piece of music uh, that, that was the march of Polish Jewish soldiers who fought on the side of Poland in the uprising of 1832. And you could multiply this um, if, if one searches online uh, under the tag term military, uh, you'll find all kinds of sources about the Jewish experience in the military in this period. Um, it's not absolutely true, I have to correct myself, uh, there were times in medieval Spain where Jews did serve That's in right. yeah, the military, yeah, yeah. so um, there's an exception. But still, it was extremely rare, and in Europe, it was a question of honor. Jews were believed to be a people who had no honor, and therefore could not defend the honor of a country. And allowing them into the military, therefore, was the falling of, of a very significant barrier to making common cause with one's countrymen. 
So one of the things that I love about the Pinkas is the fact that most of those Jews would have been drafted into the military, right? They, they didn't volunteer. It was not a volunteer <laughs> army so much. But they did voluntarily come together as Jews once they were there. So you have that mix, which is so, I think, typical of um, the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization of secular and sacred sort of together. Right? Um, and making it more, more complicated for us. Um, there is a, a question, um, I'm talking quickly because we're going to wrap up soon, about the Haggadah and um, whether you could speak, I, I assume it's calligraphy. Uh, just say a couple words about, uh, it, obviously the illustrations are painted, but what about the, um, uh, the, the, the text itself? So the calligraphy is all hand done, and it's done in two languages, in Hebrew, and a translation in German on the facing pages. Uh, and if you look at the calligraphy, you could see this is somebody who has been highly trained. It's beautifully done. I don't know if she hired somebody to, to teach her or to, to help her in some way, but it's an artifact that's just breathtakingly magnificent. So, and Dara, there was a question also to you about, uh, do you have a particular favorite excerpt from uh, the, the volume that uh, you feel speaks to us very much today? Oh gosh, there are so many. But I you think- do that, a couple. <laughs> well, I think that there's, some I actually was very moved by some of the um, some of the religious works, you know, because as someone who you know it, you know does not study uh, Hasidic texts, you know, to read these original texts is amazing, and to you know to find them really moving and to sort of see them and sort of you know see them as radical, you know, radical new texts. I think was really exciting. Um, I was also I was just amazed how many things here like. For those of you who, who maybe are, are, are not familiar with these languages, there's a lot that is here that, you know, hasn't necessarily been available before in translation. There's a lot from the Yiddish theater that's here. There's excerpts from plays. You know, I sort of want to, you know, put this on, you know, have my kids act this out in the living room. Uh, we could have our own little salon. There's, uh, you know, these, and some of these are really sort of foundational texts. There's a play like uh, Serkala, um, which is sort of this, uh, you know, this uh, satire, this Haskala that's sort of, you know, it's, you know, Jews on their way out of, you know, out of traditional life and it's sort of parodying traditional life. But you, what's amazing is to sort of see that juxtaposition between the Hasidic texts and then the texts making fun of the Hasidic texts. You know, and these are things that like, you know, if you don't read Yiddish, like you don't, you've never seen this before probably. You know, because, you know, even if they, some of them have been translated before, it's not something that, you know, people who aren't, you know, academics have, have encountered. And it's just, these sources are talking to each other. And, you know, that's, you know, to me is what's so fantastic. And, you know, oh, well, the one I met, I did mention this earlier, but I found this so beautiful. The passage um, that was, a, it was a, this sort of a memoir or letter from the, um, this Jewish peddler traveling through the United States and just talking about the experience of carrying this like, you know, 100 pound pack and walking through Pennsylvania, like, you know, walking hundreds of miles through Pennsylvania. And, you know, there was this, you know, this Jewish, you know, there's this like, you know, family, the Smiths that are, you know, there, I, I asked if I could sleep in their barn. The lady said no, but then, you know, it was a thunderstorm. So finally she said yes, you know, and he's like, he did they didn't even buy anything. I mean, and it's sort of like, you know, this, you know, you see like, like, wow, how much this person is suffering and, you know, to send, you know, 10 cents back home. I mean, you just see this, uh, you know, what, what Ellie Sheva said, you see the humanity of these people in a way that we don't, you know, when we sort of look at them as this like sepia tone, you know, official past, you really hear their voices and that's really just fantastic. So thank you all very much. I think we're, we're, we should wrap up now. There are uh, um, ways to, to get to this and enjoy it yourself. You go to posenlibrary.com. And yeah, those are, it's written down there. Um, and you register for free. It's free, but you, you need to register. And then you have a chance to browse through 
volume six, as we've been talking about it, but there's also volume 10, which covers the years from 1973 up to 2005, and uh, volume eight, which covers the years uh, between 1918 and 1939. So um, volume nine is gonna be added uh, certainly before the end of this year. So the posenlibrary.com is accessible. Uh, the actual volumes are available at a discount um, from Yale University Press. Um, I want to thank um, the Center for Jewish History for partnering with us and hope that um, everybody, you know, had um, both learned but also had these um, intriguing questions uh, raised um, about uh, discovering midwives, discovering soldiers, discovering um, various types of Jewish people whom we hadn't necessarily uh, thought about before and thinking about the implications of what happens when we bring all of them into um, a conversation and may consider them also part of Jewish culture and civilization. So thank you, Elisheva Karbach. Thank you, Dara Horn. Thank you, Itamor Barachov and Malgo um, and everyone else who, who worked to make this um, such a fine program.